everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of Attendance Bias. I am your host, Brian Weinstein. Today's guest is a returning guest, Sean Fawcett of Colorado. Sean previously appeared on Attendance Bias to tell us his story from Fish's show from December 6th, 1996 at the Aladdin Theater in Las Vegas. Sean is originally from the Southwest, so while discussing that legendary Las Vegas show, it casually came up that he also happened to attend the show we are discussing today, November 2nd, 1998, at the E-Center in Salt Lake City, Utah. At that moment, I almost stopped that recording immediately because I wanted to pivot to talk about that show, the so-called Dark Side of the Moon show. But in that split second, I thought better of it, and Sean agreed on the spot to come back for a second episode of Attendance Bias to talk about that dark side show. What you're about to hear is the result of that promise. While November 2nd, 1998 is the focus of today's conversation, and we do our best to keep it there, there are many references to the 1996 Vegas show, the 1998 Halloween show, and even a jump or two to the Baker's Dozen. So if you're a casual fish fan, you may need to do a little bit of homework to gain an understanding of the context of today's legendary show. But before that, let's talk about Halloween cover albums, the reputation of the Dead Goat Saloon, and the loudest crowd reactions ever, as Sean Fawcett talks about November 2nd, 1998 at the E-Center in Salt Lake City. Sean, welcome back to Attendance Bias. How are you? Great. Thank you for having me back. I'm excited. I am too. You are the returning champion, and this may be the only episode, or you may be the only guest, where we decided to have a second episode while we were recording the first. Oh, that's exciting. Very. I feel honored. (laughs) Yes, you should. Let's remind the audience when you were previously here. So we recently spoke about the other legendary show in the Southwest, not that there's only two, but uh, one of the other most high profile shows, I would suggest, uh, December 6th, 1996 in Las Vegas. And over the course of that conversation, uh, the the state of Utah came up a a number of times because that's where you're from originally, correct? Yeah. Yep. But in the course of speaking about Utah, I asked you, were you at the show that we're talking about today, November 2nd, 1998, in Salt Lake City at, quote, the E-Center? And you said yes. And I almost I almost stopped our recording that time and said, let's ditch that. Let's ditch Vegas and just travel over to Salt Lake City. Thought better of it. So we're starting fresh today with the discussion of the famous Dark Side of the Moon show from November 2nd, 98, in Salt Lake City. Yeah, it's probably good to have the progression from the first show since it's like the prequel to this Arpua. Yeah, I'm excited to talk about that part too because there are references to the December 6, 96 show during the Harpua today in the 98 show. But before we get there, you've already gone through the attendance by his lightning round, but I tried to mishmash and bring up a bunch of new questions so that we get even deeper to know you as a fan on the new and improved Sean Fawcett Attendance bias lightning round. Attendance bias lightning round. We talked about these two questions, the first two last episode, but for anyone who's listening to this one that didn't get there, when was your first fish show? Uh, my first fish show was 8296 at Wolf Mountain Amphitheater in Park City, Utah. Start of summer tour 96. And what was your most recent fish show? Uh, the last show I saw was the Sci-Fi Soldier set, which was great. Just loved it. And I got to ask, how many times have you re-listened to it since? You know, I probably only re-listened to it like two or three times in a couple of weeks right afterward. Yeah, I listened to Sci-Fi Soldier once. And I don't know, I think speaking of an episode or a podcast called Attendance Bias, I feel like I almost had to be there to appreciate the enormity of it. This is one of the few times that I feel a little bit too much on the outside to really understand and enjoy what happened at the time. Yeah, it seems like a lot of fans have that same feeling like, oh, it could have been cool, but I wasn't there. So you didn't get as much of the excitement. Um, I'm a huge Halloween fan. Like, it's my favorite thing to go to for fish shows, uh, just because they give you that extra little bit. And this one was just just so much fun. The whole four-day weekend. After the most recent fish show, 
This seems like a silly question considering your background, but overall, East Coast fish or West Coast fish? Ah, uh, West Coast fish. Aside from the long drives, you know, they're part of it. East Coast would, is nice. I've done one of those tours where you can hit 11 shows within six hours of each other, but you really get a lot of time to like think about the shows when you're doing West Coast tour. What's the longest you've driven from one show to another? Oh, probably we had to leave the gorge for some unfortunate uh, circumstances in 97 and we drove to Utah and then back out to California to get the next leg. So I missed one of the gorge shows in that summer tour, but that probably had to have been, I don't know, 1500 miles in a couple of days. Wow. Wow. See on the East coast, it's the longest drive by mileage is never that long, but as traffic goes, it oh, always makes yeah. it so much longer. Yeah. No, we just have the distances. Like right. right, 500 miles to the next show. What is the best meal you've ever had on tour? Um, I loved the jerry rolls that they had at Magna Ball. They were just these giant egg rolls. Um, and I would go, after I ate one of those, I would go to the like dance club section that was at the back of the uh, lawn. And they had uh, cuddly but muscular cocktails. It was like a whiskey-based cocktail. Plus, you could get some, like, dancing going on in the little pseudo club. We saw uh, the tent at Curveball. They were setting up. So we were just, like, you know, hanging out, waiting to eat a jerry roll when we got the bad news that the show was canceled. So didn't get the jerry roll that time, unfortunately. What is your favorite fish cover song overall? Overall, it's going to have to be Roses Are Free. I really like how they like, you know, play around with that. I feel like it's almost their song now, with the one exception of that Smells Like Teen Spirit that we can chat about. <laughs> I can't wait to dig into that. Uh, well, you know what? I'll stop right there because we'll, we'll get there. I have a feeling at any moment I could just spoil all the thoughts I have for today's <laughs> yeah. show. But let's, yeah. so let's wrap up the lightning round. If you had a time machine and you could go back to witness any fish moment, whether it's on stage or off stage, where or when would you go see? Um, as I mentioned earlier, I love the Halloween shows. And I feel like the only one I've missed since they've been back is the Festival 8 show. So I, I really regret missing the acoustic set. And I know that that kind of is like, that's what, that's out of 30 years of music, that's what you want to hear. But it just seemed like a nice, pleasant little afternoon. Acoustic fish is a treat and it's a rarity. Yeah. It's not something yeah. we get to see that often. I know that at the time of this recording, Trey is playing a couple of solo shows, which is its own special treat. But how rare? I mean, have you ever seen acoustic fish, like all four of them on stage? Uh, I don't think so. I'm trying to think of like, no, I remember listening to Acoustic Army back in the day and just like wanting to hear that. I don't think I've ever seen them all on stage acoustic. When was this show played? Lemon Wheel closed the summer tour in 98, the festival up in Maine. And the band played a string of performances in October, uh, kind of to plug and promote the story of the ghost, which was released right before Halloween. It was released on October 27th of 1998. So some of these appearances, I mean, most of them were not truly fish shows like we just discussed. Uh, some of them were a single set show at Farm Aid, which had many collaborations, debuts. They played with Neil Young, uh, Willie Nelson, Daniel Lanoy, and others. And then they played a full hit and run show with the Fillmore in San Francisco. I had no idea that this existed before doing the research, did you? I, I knew about the Farm Aid show and I knew about the Bridge School benefit, but the rest of that I didn't know until like much more recently. And there's good reason for it. I found out that this show at the Fillmore was kept secret until the moment that the on sale locations were announced on the radio at the time. This is before Twitter, obviously, and any social media, really. If you can imagine a world without social media, right, and let's... I'll be happy for that imagination. Yeah. So, so imagine a world where Fish played a hit and run show at a small venue. The Fillmore is. I don't know off the top of my head. I'm guessing maybe five thousand. I want to say it's pretty small. I feel like I've 
been, I feel like I've been there. I got a miracle to a dead show once and I feel like it is pretty small. So they're not really started on a tour yet. They have a new album out and they decide to play a show at this small venue in your town or near your town. The only time you find out it's happening is over the radio, whatever DJ in your town announces where the tickets are on sale and they're on sale now. And you got to hurry up and get them or else you're shut out after 5,000 people pick them up and it's over. You're either in or you're not. Yeah, what a what a crazy way to do it. It reminded me of earlier that year when they played the Island Tour show. You know, that was announced in advance, but they had no advertisements, no marketing, nothing. They just kind of announced it on their website. And if you lived within uh, the area, Rhode Island or Long Island, you either got tickets or you didn't. It wasn't a planned out tour. So I guess they were kind of transitioning and kind of feeling their popularity in the fall of 1998. Yeah, as far as I know about the Island Tour, I wasn't uh, in the know about that at the time. I remember listening to one of your other episodes, someone else talking about it. And I'm like, oh, that's cool how they just, like, let's play some shows. So later in the month, uh, you mentioned the Bridge School Benefit. They played at the Shoreline Amphitheater, both of which, speaking of acoustic sets, that's the one I was thinking of. So they played two shows that were mostly acoustic. They played a television broadcast set for sessions at West 54th with David Byrne, which is available on YouTube, which is very funny. You see the band all of a sudden, even Trey get very quiet and introverted speaking with David Byrne. I'm going to have to go back and watch that just to watch them squirm. I think it's about an hour long and David Byrne brings up to them he goes, and a couple of years ago, you played an album that's very personal to me, I think is the way Byrne says it. And you could see Trey kind of put his hand over his mouth. Yeah. Like a, like an awkward sort of, Oh, we did. Did you like it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that, that came back during the Baker's dozen when someone asked Trey about playing everything in its right place by Radiohead and having Fishman sing it of all people. And oh, I didn't hear about that. I, yeah. I remember hearing uh, everything in its right place, but. I think it was an interview in the New York times. And he said, if they ever hear it, they being Radiohead, I hope they understand that it was done with love. Nice. To try nice. to cover his bases. Yeah. Uh, it was, that was a, that was an okay cover. It was. That was another attendance bias. If you yeah, were there, you yeah. loved it. If you weren't, it's easy to criticize. So, But after that show, uh, the Bridge School and the Sessions at West 54th, they played Birds of a Feather on Letterman before they properly kicked off the fall tour on October 29th at the Greek Theater in L.A. So they started on the West Coast this time. The Greek is a single night show, and then they moved to Las Vegas for the next two nights at the Thomas and Mack Center on October 30th and 31st, the Halloween run during which the band played a series of, I was surprised, a series of incredible dark and ambient jams on the 30th, where they also acknowledged their 15th anniversary, which years later was acknowledged to be December 2nd, not October 30th. On the 31st, they played a full cover of the Velvet Underground's Loaded, uh, which from what I understand, and I imagine you were there, right? Uh, yeah. Yep. All right, so yeah. I, well, I'm curious about this part. Even at the time, my understanding was that it was not as well received as Quadrophenia or the White Album or Remain in Light. I love this album and I love their cover of it, but that's after the fact. You know, it got me to dig a little deeper into the Velvet Underground. I knew who they were. I knew Sweet Jane. I knew who Lou Reed was. He grew up not far from my hometown, but I didn't really understand the enormity and influence of the Velvet Underground as a band. And that, so I feel like the band knew something that we all didn't when they decided to play Loaded. When you were there, was it, was that the vibe there that it was kind of a quieter reception than the previous more popular albums that they covered? Um, probably my bias was that I didn't know a lot of Velvet Underground. Like you're saying, I knew Sweet Jean and any random Velvet Underground songs that would be on like movie soundtracks or something. So I was excited. I was excited because I knew of them and I'd like to learn more about them. And I think my, my like crew was as well, but I, I didn't really get a good feel about how everybody else felt about it because I was just so excited. Like, this is my first Halloween show. What are they going to play? And I was happy that that's what they chose uh, rather than, you know, like Rolling Stones or something. The third set of that Halloween show though, continues to confound fans years and years after it was played. 
Because the band opened with a 30 minute Wolfman's brother, which if anyone ever asks for, quote, dark fish, this might be the first suggestion uh, to give anyone looking for that. So they play a 30 minute Wolfman's brother before it kind of dissolves into Piper, builds back up into Ghost, which only after eight minutes, like 98 was a pretty strong year for Ghost overall, but only after eight minutes of playing it, the band finds themselves into this like dissonant feedback loop. And that's it. That's the the set. The whole set, I think, is less than an hour. Yeah, I don't know the exact time on it, but it felt weird there. You know, the third set, we had just come through Velvet Underground. And I remember Ghost coming on. I'm like, oh, it's Halloween. This is going to be a 35 minute ghost. I've got time to go to the bathroom, come back and do whatever. So I make my way to the bathroom. And then as soon as I get inside, I hear applause. Okay. It took me eight minutes to get there, I guess. And uh, I'm like, wait, what's going on? The show's over. Like, it seemed like something was awry. And only after the fact that I find out that like Trey, it seemed like Trey walked off stage, like things got too crazy for him. Yeah, it's worth bringing this up, even though this episode is ostensibly about the next show in Salt Lake City. I do think that it's impossible to kind of understand the context or to understand that show without understanding the context of the vibe and the feeling of Halloween night. The only thing I knew about it was what I've read and what I've heard offhand. So I'm really glad to speak with someone who was at both shows. My understanding is that after Halloween, that the next show was this one in Salt Lake City. And so the East Center is, is it in Salt Lake City? It's in West Valley, which is like a suburb of Salt Lake. So it's like, I don't know, 15 minutes out of downtown Salt Lake. Okay, so yeah, let's let's just call it Salt Lake City. So I understand that most fans skip this stop on the tour from Vegas to Salt Lake because after that was Denver. Mm -hmm. And that in 97, there was a huge Denver show in November, right? November 17th, I think. So I think in a lot of fans' heads who were traveling by car was just, you know what? Salt Lake City is like a combined six hours out of the way going there and then from there to Denver. I did a Google Maps just to see. Uh, uh, Even though Google Maps didn't exist at the time, it just seemed like it was more of a straight line from Mm -hmm. Vegas to Denver than to go out of your way to Salt Lake City. They skipped Salt Lake, a lot of fans did, Uh, My research told me that if you stop in Salt Lake City on the way from Vegas to Denver, it's about 14 hours in the car. It's 955 miles. Yeah. If you cut out Salt Lake City and go straight from Vegas to Denver, it's about three hours and 200 miles less. Yeah. So from a logistical standpoint, I probably would have done that, to be honest, knowing myself as a logistical and, quote, rational fan. I probably would have just been like, let's save some gas, save some time. Vegas is probably insane. Let's get some sleep. Let's go straight to Denver and get a day off. Yeah. And Utah definitely was known as like a sketchy state to drive through for some of the fans. So there was a solid sort of we ain't going to go through Utah longer than we have to sort of deal. Um, This last Halloween my wife and I, we drove from Denver to Vegas and it was 10 hours. And we met my friend from Utah there and actually drove him back to his town, which is near Salt Lake, and then made the uh, trip back. So yeah, it's definitely longer to hit Salt Lake and back. And I can't wait to hear more about the people who were there because you mentioned in our previous episode that you knew a lot of people at this show. Yeah. And that growing up in Salt Lake City, or at least in Utah, not being Mormon, you know, it kind of felt like a little bit strange overall, right? That you kind of felt like most people were in one room and you were in the other. Yeah, it definitely, it it definitely, Utah is a lot uh, real black and white, not like racially, but um, demographically, like you're either Mormon or you're not. And Mormons are great. I got nothing against them. I was baptized, but I didn't, at that point in my life, I didn't feel like I belonged. And how old were you? At this point, uh, 1998, I was 18 years old. So all those fans that decided to skip Salt Lake, Fish kind of laughs at logistics, right? Mm-hmm. When everyone says, all right, let's just skip that show. Let's go straight to Denver. They're kind of digging their own grave, so to speak, yeah. in terms of missing what they shouldn't miss. So this show in Salt Lake City was, quote, according to Jam Base, sparsely attended. So as a result, they treated fans who were there 
to a -a once-in-a-lifetime event, something that we're talking about today, however many years later, as if it happened last night with that same sense of energy. So you were 18 years old. How many shows did you see on this tour? Where were you in 1998? Who were you? Uh, 1998 was a crazy year. I had, you know, I'd fallen into the whole fish thing and I would work temp jobs to make enough money to hit five or six shows. Uh, I remember I was like on the road a lot. We had lived in San Francisco, like sleeping in a van on the street for a week. Whoa. And, like, put into like someone's house for three weeks because the roommates moved out. And so I probably logged like 3000 miles that whole year, just driving around for the tour. I started that year at the Greek theater and then did the two Halloween shows in Vegas, uh, the dark side show, and then Denver afterward. So you saw the first chunk of the tour. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. The first opener and then the next four. And what are your overall memories of the fall 98? Because the summer of 98, We've discussed with other guests a number of shows from that tour, and that is pretty much summarized. The elevator pitch would be the summer of covers. In a short segment, what would you consider the summary of the fall of 98? For me, it was just, I guess it was all about the two Halloween episodes, so to say. I had never been to the Greek before, so we did a long drive from Utah to LA, and then back to Vegas, and then back to Utah. But... And I didn't really listen to a lot after that. So I was just so excited to have been to like that chunk of shows in the West. And this is the last question I always ask in this segment. And I debated whether or not it's worth asking. Why do you have a tendency bias toward this show? (laughs) I feel silly even saying it aloud. Uh, Well, you know, it's um, I've got a tendency bias because as far as I know, and I think outside of my Utah group of friends, not a lot of people have seen it. So I haven't had a chance to talk to anybody about it. And it's dark side of the moon. You know, like I think that I would have presumed by that point, fans would have been clamoring for that cover at Halloween. Um, It is a short album, but gosh, what a show. What a special treat. Set one. The first set opens with Tube, which is an uncommon opener. And when I was looking at the song Times, Tube to Start is 14 minutes. Yeah, that's crazy. I went to see if I could find out how, like, the the length of it. And I found a, a jam chart, and it seemed to have been the fourth longest tube. That was just, like, the hardcore jams, though. I, I didn't go through everything. Right. Well, Tube, I think, in 97 and 98 was kind of the crucible of when it was taken from, oh, a fun four-minute rarity to, okay, this could go anywhere now. Mm -hmm. That Dayton tube really did a lot to turn it on its head in terms of fan expectations. And this tube belongs up there with any other one that they've ever played. Yeah, this one was great. I haven't heard the Dayton one, so I'm going to have to give that a listen. I mean, the whole song in terms of lyrics is over by a minute. Yeah. And this is, uh... yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, I, I had nothing other than it was like, <laughs> I was just so excited. I think about Harris Whittles. Wasn't he a huge, like, they need a jam tube? Yes. Like, I uh, rest in peace. Yeah, love Harris. The thing about this tube also is that it only takes about three minutes to be clear that this is an unusual and maybe an exceptional show. Obviously, you never know anything three minutes into a first set, but there's something about it where the band... I don't know, maybe it's it's uh, looking back, you know, kind of looking back on what we know now and applying it to the past. But there's something about listening to this that says this show is already different from others. Five minutes into the show, you know, not to not into the song, but into the whole show, there's a jam that takes a turn into a minor key. It's like I wrote the word space funk in my notes and I barely wrote one paragraph so far. That doesn't happen that often.
<laughs> yeah, especially for the first song, you know, sometimes it's just something to like warm up, so to say, but not this one. Right, and notable. The rest day really got them. The rest day and... And notably, they stop. They completely end tube and then they go right back into it. Yeah. On, on uh, Fish.in, the track is listed as tube, segue, tube. Oh, that's interesting. I, li- I listened to it on relisten.net. Yeah, it's the same just... thing. It's the same recording. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's like just 15 minutes as one track. But you definitely, there is like a solid like 20 seconds where like are they going to stop it maybe 10 seconds And there's even a fake out where Fishman think like he does the the transition into the blues ending. Yeah. And Trey's having none of it. Yeah. It's wonderful. It's uh, if you don't realize by set one first song that you're somewhere else, that it's going to be a different show. The next one does it. They play Drowned, which is, again, an all time great version of one of the best jam vehicles of late 1.0. Yeah, I didn't know a lot about Drowned. I remember Tube, though, and having tons of dance room because the whole venue was like half full. Yeah, let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the E Center or as Trey says, the E Center? The e Center. Uh, yeah, so it's just, I think it's a hockey rink uh, normally. Um, it's set up the same way as like MGM uh, in Vegas is, you know, the stage. Uh, there's no seats behind and then uh, the rows of seats on the side with a bowl flat in the middle. The first two sections of seats on the right and the left were the only seats filled. And then half of the pit, for lack of a better word, was filled. So the twirlers had, you know, 500 square feet to do whatever they want each, basically. You just had so much space and you could get really up close to the band without having to be quote unquote on the rail and they must have really had a great time going drown because about three minutes in there's the the 515 bridge the mm-hmm. you know from this the who song the more popular song 515 which you know they kind of insert in the middle of drowned this version is powerful and i wrote a little unhinged like they're kind of rushing through it i got this vibe throughout the show they obviously knew that they were going to play dark side in the second set that they were purposefully extending everything. And they were kind of holding about 40 minutes in the second set as a placeholder, like, all right, let's stretch everything out as much as I could. They really turned it on. Like people suggested Michael Jordan could do on the bulls that one night they just decide to be better. Right. It seemed to me like it was a mix between like really amped up fast energy songs and a lot of like ambient spacey stuff, like almost as if they were kind of practicing those weird Pink Floyd sounds during some of the ambient jams, not in Drown, of course, but just overall throughout the show. Later in the in the set and the very beginning of the second set, they're not all just straight ahead rock. They do have some jammy, spacey, airy parts, yeah. but they're counterbalanced by something like Drown, which is straight ahead. Yeah. Like exactly. almost mimicking the who. Mm-hmm. I really like the straight ahead, fast, dancey songs. And so the ambient too. Jam, like, you know, I'll close my eyes and listen. They're not my favorite, but 
the interplay between the two, like you're saying, is, was great. And there's a part at six minutes and 40 seconds where I wrote, it's all drive, that there's this amazing riff where Trey finger taps and Fishman catches up right up with him as if they are the Who. And I'm a huge fan of that band. So whenever the band plays Drowned, I love it. But when Trey and Fishman, who don't really sound anything like their counterparts in the Who, mm-hmm. they kind of absorb that sound, it drives yeah. me crazy in the best way. Yeah, that part was great. I liked uh, being able to chat with you about this because a lot of fans know more about this stuff than I do. Like as <laughs> yourself as a musician, like just listening to that and being able to pick it out, like, yeah, that's great. That is fun. Right. I mean, Keith Moon for all of his gifts had no touch at all to him. The drum set was a playground and he was you know, like an eight year old kid with ADHD, yeah. not on meds. And he just yeah. did everything he could. And Pete Townsend was an amazing rhythm player and Trey, they're kind of the opposite where Fishman is. I mean, he has muscle when he needs to, mm-hmm. but he's, he has all touch and Trey, his lead guitar playing is much stronger than his rhythm. He's not known yeah. as a great rhythm guitarist, even though he's good. So to kind of play that song, but switch roles while still playing the same instruments. I mean, I could go deep in my head about this. Yeah, that's awesome. me when i was a kid but yeah it's the greatest album ever in my opinion right Uh, but when you think of great versions of drown here's the ones i i thought of off the top of my head there's september 14th 2000 it's back which is released on a version of live fish there's and i'm sorry that's in um Darien Lake. SPAC was in 2004, New Year's 95, which I think everyone knows that drowned. Yeah. Uh, December 12th, 99 in Hartford. And this one, again, slide it right in. Just like Tube, this matches any other great version you can mention of this song. Fully agreed. And to wrap it all up, it kind of drifts off and starts into Jesus Left Chicago, where Trey plays those opening riffs slowly, almost like Mike's disintegrates into I am hydrogen. Yeah, it was a nice little jazzy to bluesy transition between those two. You know, I always feel like when they break out Jesus Left Chicago, it's kind of a, speaking of playgrounds, kind of just a show off for Trey and Paige while keeping yeah. that blues backbeat. Yeah, Any anything you got with Paige being able to play the organ like that and take up all the attention, I'm there for. And next are two shorter and softer songs. We talked earlier about Acoustic Fish, We got Driver, which was played acoustic, and then Bittersweet Motel, which now introduces the first part of this story time show that would thread throughout. Yeah, I like that these, um, because the crowd was so empty, I feel like they're like, oh, we could play an acoustic song and 
like everyone can hear it, you know, sure. They got PAs and everything, but I think that the small crowd lent itself to them being like, Hey, we're almost back in the dead goat saloon with, you know, six people. Let's just play these again. Have you ever been there? No, I haven't. I, I moved out of Utah, like when I was 23. So I didn't spend a lot of time at the bars or private clubs as they were. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so for those of you who haven't heard this entire show, Trey tells the story before Driver, or as she's kind of picking at it. Thank you so much for coming. And- I want to dedicate a song to two people that we met last night. At, um, I don't know if any of you have heard of a, co- of a bar called The Dead Goat. You know The Dead Goat? Well, we went there last night, and I guess on uh, Sunday nights they have an open mic, and there's about six people playing at the open mic. And uh, I spent a lot of time talking to a group called Wendy and Lisa. They're a songwriting and singing group from around here. And anyway, uh, Mike and I went down there, and we ended up playing some songs. We played this song that we're going to play, which is a new song. Some of you have heard it already. And some of you have And, um... Anyway, they were really nice, and the people at the bar were really nice and took care of us and gave us free beers and stuff. So I want to thank them, and thank you. And the next song they play live at this show, Bittersweet Motel, where they, they uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but they taught the whole audience at the Dead Goat Salute how to sing it, brought everyone up on stage and sang to an empty room. Yeah, so it was like there wasn't an audience, basically, which just the whole band was just the members of the audience, including wait staff was up there singing Bittersweet Motel. <laughs> I would love to be someone who had no idea who Fish is. Yeah. I went and did some history about the Dead Goat Saloon yesterday, and I guess it's closed down now, but it was a place where just tons of musicians would come through. So they would have a whole different uh, amount of genres of music just come and play in this little dive bar. I wonder if they knew that. And so it became kind of a let's stop here since we got into Utah a little early. That's what it seemed like. After that small acoustic slash slow interlude, They go into Limb by Limb, which is another story of the ghost song. At least I know it was played sooner than that, but it's off the new album at the time, which I'm excited to hear this when I press play on this, because 1998 was like a banner year for Limb by Limb. I even put a note, and I don't know if it's all right to say this out loud either, that around six minutes, Trey's playing reminded me of Jerry Garcia a little bit. say that 
<laughs> I um I was never a big Dead fan. Like I like them, but I, when I fish was my my thing. So I will take your word for it. All right, fair enough. And so there was this ambience in 1998, and Limb by Limb was a great avenue for it. Yeah, Limb by Limb for me was like my high school song. I just remember like wandering around the schools, cranking it on my Walkman while all the kids were in class. Just loved it. They, again, perfect set list construction because after this big fun jam and limb by limb, they calm it down again with Waiting in the Velvet Sea. And I felt by now everyone probably needed a break with, again, another song that was on Story of the Ghost. Yeah, Waiting for me is a nice little break song. Kind of bring it down. I'm not going to use that term song. It would it would be an errand song. Where I go and sure. do show errands. And to close the whole set, they play Sample in a Jar. And I was curious, because this is normally a show opener or maybe in the two spot. And I thought immediately while listening that it, would, it had been a while since they closed the set with this song, especially a first set. So I did a little bit of research. They did it a bunch in 1994. They closed oh, a yeah. lot of first sets when the song was new. Yeah. Because it's a big, you know, it's a big guitar solo. It's a big, fun rock song. So yeah. that makes sense. But as of this recording, as of the time that I was listening to this show, the last time they closed this, a first set with Sample in a Jar was March 3rd, 2003 in Greensboro, North Carolina. So it's been a long while. Oh, yeah. If you're listening, you could bring it back and really blow some yeah. stat nerds' minds. Right? I, I would even take like a, a sample fest, you know, just come... Can, uh, go in and out of it for a whole set. I love Sample in a Jar. It reminds me of like when I first started listening to Fish on that uh, studio album. I'm not sure which ones it's on, but so good. Were you at Jam Night for the Baker's Dozen? No, no. Yeah. Because there was a very good Sample in a Jar that night. All right. I'm going to put that on my to listen to list now, too. Yeah, definitely. I'm kicking myself for missing the Baker's Dozen. Like 13 shows, we could have made two of them. (laughs) Set two. So Sample ended the first set, and the second set is where things get very interesting, even though the set one is nothing to sneeze at. I remember when I first got these tapes, I imagine myself along with many others fast-forwarded straight to set two. Yeah, probably. When I re-listened, that's what I did. Yeah, of course. I remember listening to set two, of course, the Harpua and Dark Side. And I listened to set one after that part. I kind of listened to the second half of set two and then started from the beginning. So this big middle chunk right here, which is Down With Disease, Mango Song, Moma Dance, You Enjoy Myself, right? Not nothing. It was the last part that I got to listen to, almost like Pulp Fiction, where the middle happens <laughs> yeah. last. And so it was very interesting to hear it, not for the first time, because I've listened to it since, but to hear it anew in a chronological sense, literally from beginning to end. So the second set opens with Down With Disease, which is relatively short. It's only about nine minutes. It definitely seems like he's playing faster just to like, oh, we got a special store and surprise or special treat ready for y'all. Well, I wanted to ask you that because I had similar thoughts. It sounds like, and I wrote this down at three minutes and 10 seconds. It sounds like Trey's extra anxious to get to the solo, the big down with disease solo and zooming out, knowing what we know now, maybe he's extra anxious to get through the next few songs so they can bust out that extra special treat. Do you, what are your, what's your opinion on that? Do you think I'm projecting too much? No, I think that typically down to with disease, I want to say just, I'm just throwing out ballpark numbers here. It's easy 12, 13, you know, on an average show. But when you listen to this one, he really is like playing like crazy. And they all are. Yeah. Uh, like I put in my notes, I expected to hear a hey, you know, from like, <laughs> yeah. you know? like I was just waiting to hear it. Come on, you might as well. Um, yeah, didn't let up at all though.
Yeah, my phrase was crazy buzzsaw energy. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly what it's like. And after Down With Disease, which was relatively short, they play the Mango song, which my only note really is everyone loves the Mango song. It's true. There's nothing <laughs> bad to say about it. Then so they play the I'm Moment sorry. Dance, which is super funky right from the start. And another Story of the Ghost song, it should be noted, uh, that there's this interesting descending chord progression at about five and a half minutes from both Trey and Paige that makes this moba dance a little spooky because we are still on the heels of halloween yeah it, you can almost hear like when i think he's on the grand piano like almost plinking is the term i would use but it definitely has that spooky feel i love the spookiness of the story of the ghost album overall like it's it has this like a rhythmic because you, you if you play it on repeat it just like is like one big circle and it keeps going with that uh i want to say the jam siren yeah, uh, it is the jam siren. Yeah. So I feel like, you know, Rick's your dream album. Well, I always thought of Go Story of the Ghost as like a sketchy fever dream album. Yeah, I've I've heard it the same way that Ghost, which leads off the album, it doesn't just start. It leads in from a fade up volume wise. Yeah. That it's almost and like then, the band has been playing and you're just showing up here. Exactly. And then end of session kind of brings it back in with that the same way out i always confuse moma and ghost because of that and yeah they the sound the same in the beginning person. yeah yeah and but this moba dance fits right in it's almost like it's lifted straight from the album but extended a little bit more with some funky jamming before they play a 24 minute you enjoy myself oh right if this show were played last night can you imagine the reaction before oh, dark side yeah. forget dark side of the moon yeah yeah uh, the 24 minute YEM. Yeah. That, um, man, everybody loves YEM as well. I really like the, uh, part where they start doing like a vocal jam. What did I put in here? Like pre 15 minutes. You can hear like Trey playing and him doing a vocal jam. It's, there's a lot here. I mean, they're literally, it's almost a half hour, but yeah. there's a lot within that half hour. It's, you know, everyone knows this show as the dark side show. And of course I call it that too, for, with good reason. But if they play just typical 98, 1998 songs and jams toward the end of this show, it would still be hugely memorable. Yeah. Like the set list already as it is, it's pretty great. In that, in that, had they drag, had they, had they extended the songs on the second set, it's like you would almost have a five song second set. Yeah, we're not far off yeah. from there. But then after you enjoy myself, this is where everything takes a turn. Everything is flipped on its head. So there's an extra long pause after you enjoy myself. And this must have blown minds when the um papa starts. It's obvious why they did this in retrospect when Trey tells his story. But what is what was the feeling there? Um, I don't remember the long pause after YEM specifically. You know, sometimes they'll shuffle around on stage or whatever, and they typically get into the jam relatively quick for the next one. The second I had heard Um Papa, I just flipped out, knowing what I'd heard from Vegas two years prior to that. And I'd probably seen 20 shows in the in the interim between those two. 
So I felt like I had a good amount of like fish knowledge under my belt mm -hmm. compared to my uh, Utah buddies, most of them. And oh, I just lost it. Love Harpua, love the Oompa Pa. Uh, you could tell everyone was like, oh, this is going to be a, a special night. And it already was, as we've said. Yeah. It already was, but this really just gives it an extra, you know, like toward the end of the finish line. And we're not even that far from the end of the show, right? There's only about 35 or 40 minutes left. Yeah. Maybe like 40 or 50. Yeah. So this is an extra boost to hear Harpua toward the middle of a second set. And after we get through the, you know, we'll help you party down part, the really fun yeah. part of the song, Trey <laughs> starts his narration just over two minutes in where he says, I love this place. I'm in love with this place. I'm in love with everyone here. Okay, well, we're happy to be here at the E Center. What a good place to be. I love this place. I'm in love with this place. So I love everyone here. I love everything. so warm and full of love. The e Center. <laughs> so this is the story. I'll now tell you the story of another person who is full of love, and that is, of course, the, the infamous Jimmy. And that's what this song is going to be about, Jimmy. And what happened to Jimmy? And, so what... Uh, is he joking? What do you I think? I think he is. I think that he was making a joke specifically about the place being called the E Center. He was, yeah. Yeah. So he's just like, oh, I love this place. And it was, you know, humorous to all of us. That wasn't ever my scene on Fish Tour, but I, I can appreciate the humor about it. Sure, sure. And he so he gets into the Jimmy narration and he talks about Jimmy's grandfather founding a town and how Jimmy feels cooped up in this small town and he leaves to go to Las Vegas to find some excitement. Is he talking about Salt Lake city? Uh, no, I don't think so. Well, he, I mean, no one knows place. really. What do you think? Uh, I don't know. At this point I was like, Oh, that's weird. Because like one of my great, great grandfathers founded a small town in Utah, one of my polygamist grandfathers. <laughs> okay. And uh, so I'm like, Oh, he's kind of bringing it back. He's probably talking about, jimmy's relatives like joseph smith founding utah itself uh -huh. is my thought he also talked about how it's like not the most action-filled place which is true you know trey says you may have heard this story before when he's telling yeah. the story about jimmy and then he starts referencing yeah. elvis and yodelers which yeah. you were there to see oh yeah yeah and uh, only like uh four or five of my other buddies at the show there had gone to vegas with me as well so we all thought it was funny. Like, yeah, bring us another Harpua. West Coast Harpua's for the win. Yeah, obviously. I've only seen one. And again, it was during the Baker's Dozen, which is not exactly revered as this yeah. one or the Vegas one. I had heard a half a one in between at the Great Went. Oh, that's right. Because they opened with Maka Supa and then ended with a second half. And I'm like, wait a second, this is weird. Um, I think the story of that is because they played it Earlier in the tour, or maybe at the uh, Clifford oh, Ball. At the Clifford Ball, yeah. Right. They popped it like right in the middle. Right. And they finished it yeah. Yeah, at the Great really Win. Cool. Yeah, it is cool. So during this Harpua, Jimmy leaves his boring town, goes to Las Vegas, sees the Yodlers and the Elvises. And he says that Trey speaking about Jimmy says that uh, he wants to go to this concert, but it's too hard to get tickets. And so Vegas is too crazy, too many people. It's too much for him. Yeah. And I think that that Trey at that point was referencing like how he felt during Ghost. Like this is too much. We played our show. I got to get off stage. Who knows yeah, that, what he did that night? Yeah, that's the, right. That's the sense I got also that it was just kind of a different scene than it was in 1996 where everything was goofy and carefree and kind yeah. of exploiting the stereotypes of Las Vegas. This mm -hmm. 98 was much darker. Yeah, 98, too, was like, I want to say it was their second show there. And so they had two shows, and it was off the strip, and it was in a much bigger um, venue. Like, the Thomas Mack Center is probably, like, I don't know, twice the size of the Aladdin Theater. And it, it, it was packed. 
you really could see that the growth from the Aladdin to Thomas and Mac Center, um, just a fan base alone. And I could see, you know, maybe maybe they got a little crazier this next, second time in Vegas. When you get a little bit crazier, the next morning is always a bit tougher. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so this is maybe where Trey's trying to recover uh, in a small little town. Exactly. Where no one else is there, where it's only 3,000 or 4,000 people at the show. Yeah, you know, come and just play to a local crowd, a small local crowd. And the introduction in uh, Harpua to Dark Side of the Moon is Trey leaves Las Vegas, he gets into the car, and the driver puts on, quote, one of Jimmy's favorite albums. Yeah, right. Uh, who doesn't like Dark Side? And as I started listening, they go in to speak to me and breathe. As I was listening and taking notes, I found that I was taking fewer and fewer notes as Dark Side came along mm -hmm. because we're all just so familiar with it. This yeah. album must be in everyone's DNA. Yeah, I was like, I can listen to it and be like, oh, they missed a couple notes there. They, but I, I'm not playing it, so <laughs> right. power to them. And but the it was just so good. Like the chills when it came on, I still get them. Yeah, the, the story that I heard is that when they realized they being, I guess, Brad Sands or whoever their tour manager was at the time, when they looked at the numbers and the receipts and realized that this show was going to be completely undersold mm -hmm. and there's like no one coming, so to speak, that Brad Sands went in the back and said, you got to get him good. When yeah. speaking about the audience, saying uh -huh. to the band, you got to punish them, them being the audience for not coming, the snooze you lose tour. And so someone went out, bought an album of Dark Side, and they rehearsed it that afternoon to break it out that night. Yeah, that's I love it when they do that. I was at a different show in Shoreline, and I heard that they did that with a Cinnamon Girl encore. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, it just shows the level of musicianship that these four dudes can do. Like, oh, let's just learn it and play it. Yeah, and it's it's kind of like when you're learning to drive. It's one thing to know the way to get to your friend's house when you're being driven. You know every street to turn yeah. on. You know where all the stoplights and stop signs are. It's different when you're behind the wheel. So yeah, Fish, exactly. I'm sure all four members of it, of the band, have Dark Side in the Moon. They could probably just sing it mm -hmm. on a whim. But to actually play it live in front of an audience, yeah, well, that's, that's a completely that's different skill set. Yeah. Another great feature of the band. So Speak to Me, Breathe opens with that slow increase of volume as all the you know, dark side sounds, the screaming and the money and all that. We all know the yeah. beginning of it. And at about 16 seconds, I tried to make a special note that it seems that it dawns on the crowd what's about to happen and everyone goes apeshit completely. Yeah. 
I put in like 10 extra exclamation points after your ape shit. You can, <laughs> you can really like hear it. Um, the crowd goes fucking wild. It I sounds like there's 20,000 people there. It does. It does. We all just freaked out. Like, I don't think I've ever been in a fish crowd where that level of energy happens that fast. And when the first words of breathe, breathe in the air, the crowd is just loving it. You know, I'd be going nuts. This is the stuff that dreams are made of. I had a flashback to 2010 when on the Halloween run, you know, we keep mm-hmm. circling back to Halloween. That's when the band played Waiting for Columbus that year. But on the 30th, the night before, they played a whole bunch of Led Zeppelin songs in the middle of Tweezer. Uh-huh. And so when they were sound checking, the rumor going around that afternoon was they're going to play Led Zeppelin too for yeah. Halloween. They're practicing all these Led Zeppelin songs. And so number one, it's a fake out, not that different from this show, but the crowd reaction when they started mm. playing, I think it was whole lot of love during chalk dust. Everyone went crazy. Yeah. Everyone that, that you felt it in your chest. It was a similar reaction when at Dick's, when they busted out no quarter for the first time, like I look over my wife and she's just in tears of happiness. Like, yeah, this is great. And I so they, that they play it better than Zeppelin too. Cancel me now. Yeah. Well, I'll leave that to, uh, that'll go in the same closet as Trey sounding like Jerry Garcia during okay, limb by okay. limb. So those yeah. guys will hang out together. Uh, after speak to me and breathe, they play on the run, which is all that fun synthesizer and strange sound effects and stuff that must be really fun for the band, you know, making odd psychedelic noise with no structure, basically, yeah. except for Fishman on the hi-hat, which kind of keeps a heartbeat going all the way underneath all that sound. To me, it reminded me a little bit of the tower jam or the storage set from Super Bowl. Uh, there's a big cheer at the end for obvious reasons. Did you think that that was it? Uh, so this one came on and I wasn't sure like, all right, well, they played Breathe. He did say the word album. So there was an expectation there. But this kind of sounds just like you're saying, like kind of ambient, but it, Fishman's holding that beat. So everybody in the crowd was still like, what's happening next? Like they can bring out special guests. Who knows what's next? And I think that that part of the excitement was exciting. Like what's next? Like, are they going to really do this whole album? Right. The anticipation and that question yeah. is answered. It seconds later when all of the clock sounds, the alarm clock sounds to begin time. Because that's a cutoff point. You could be done with on the run and be like, all right, you know, we had our fun. Let's keep moving on. And then he could go back into the Harpua story and, you know, play other fish songs. But the second you heard those clocks, it was another, it was almost as equal as the crowd exclamation during uh, the opener breathe, speak to me, breathe. Like everyone knew like, all right, we're in it. We're going to hit this whole album tonight. Just settle in. Yeah, I have to imagine that there are top 10 fish audience reactions. And, you know, I would think something like when they played Terrapin Station in Virginia Beach uh, in 1998, again, uh, when, again, a jam jam night during the Baker's Dozen, that opening sample in a jar when they decided to veer off and jam for about 10 minutes, the crowd went absolutely insane. This probably either trumps them or is right up there with them. It's got to be like my number one moment. 
Chasing that number two, though. <laughs> yeah, you'll know it when it happens. That's right. Yeah. And so they they all, it's a little bit of a stumble to get started, but they all link up without a minute into it. And at two and a half minutes or so, they decided to play an album just that afternoon. And Trey is still nailing the solos. Yeah. Like you're saying, it's probably in his DNA. Like when I think of, you know how like you'll listen to a fish show, one specific show over and over again, Mm -hmm. and then you'll just hear like a clip of it and be like, oh, that's Vegas 96. And I know that because of this 10 second section that I've heard 500 times. That's how I feel like, oh, he's, he just knows it. As long as he can play the guitar, he's got it. They go right into Great Gig in the Sky, which is pretty funny for all of the high profile famous songs off Dark Side of the Moon, that this is the one that Fish used to play regularly in the mid 90s. Yeah, I had never heard that one. I wanted to make a comment about time. For me, oh, yeah. uh, the lyric really got me kicking around on a piece of ground in your hometown. You're waiting for someone or something to show you the way. And at that time, I was like, I still kind of am into Taoism. And like the way is like, that's what Taoism means. So I was just like, yeah, yeah. Thanks, guys. I'm going to follow you for a long time. Thanks for showing me the way. Is this like when we talked about during the December 6th show with all the Elvis references, you felt like Fish was speaking to you? Yeah. Did that happen again? Exactly. And I, I think that they kind of expanded it to all these like local... Utah people, you know, Utah can be kind of closed off for for the most part. So I wasn't the only one that I feel like they were speaking to in that arena. Me and all my friends, obviously. And like going back to your quote about Mormons, or not Mormons, but just growing up in Utah, I grew up really feeling like outcasty. And so at the end of that song says, home, home again. I like to be here when I can. Like I I had at that point adopted fish tour as my home like this is where i feel the most comfortable in my life so hearing that line you know i just want to cry about it right now just so beautiful i mean there there are moments that can't be expressed by words even if we're talking for an hour about one show that happened two decades ago (laughs) exactly so good And when they're playing the great gig in the sky, for those of you who haven't heard, whether it's from this show or in the mid nineties, they used to play it a lot, usually in the middle of Mike's song when they were going a little extra hard with the uh, smoke machines, that big vocal solo in the great gig in the sky that has yet to be equaled in my opinion on almost any rock performance studio wise Fishman does the whole thing on a vacuum cleaner. And the best part of the joke is it's pitch perfect. He nails it. Yeah. sure if he was playing the vacuum cleaner the whole time to try to hit those high notes i remember just laughing the whole song long watching him hit those high notes but it's interesting that yeah that he he could hit those with a vacuum yeah and he nails it after that is money probably the best known song of them all i would argue on dark side of the moon it was the single i don't know what do you think what do you think is the best known song like classic rock radio Oh, uh, it's, probably, it's probably money or time. I think yeah. it's more money because you have the whole, just the lyrics from it fits in with like rock radio. Yeah. And they play it. And the funny thing about this, if you were to assume that it's the most popular song from Dark Side, it's in 7-4 time. Oh, yeah. Like the original or this one is? No, the original. The the do do oh, do yeah. do yeah. do. You know, it's not a straight ahead for yeah, a rock song cool, like Drowned, cool for song. example. Mm-hmm. I and, thought during the Harpua too that it was fast. 
because I had only heard the slow harpo with Primus. Right. Just random note. <laughs> but money, it's the only time during this whole show, or at least this whole cover, where they kind of mess up a little bit. And it's obviously forgivable, but you yeah. can hear someone comes in a beat early. It might be Fishman. Yeah, it, they're doing a good enough job. And at the time, I was like, I don't even care. We're all having fun. Yeah, it's it must be so difficult. Yeah, I, I can't even imagine it. I fake playing the guitar pretty well, but nowhere even close. Yeah, and even though Fish is a band that could play, you know, songs by Rush or Yes or however many strange uh, prog rock influences that they have, a song to, that they just started playing that day, probably for maybe 20 minutes backstage, yeah. they still pull it off quite nicely. Yeah, they definitely did a, a good enough job on it. A great job compared to what I would have done. Oh, for sure. For right? sure. And this is around the time after money that when I look at my notes, they become maybe two sentences a piece because yeah. the rest of the album is so familiar and instinctual that, and Fish does such a faithful I wrote uh, serene and faithful to the original for us and them that it's, it, it's almost like just listening to the album again, but it's your favorite band playing it. Yeah. And us and them on the album. It had, it, that's kind of like your lull, almost like your driver, bittersweet acoustic kind of yeah. like, let's, let's bring it down a bit before we go into any color you like that one. Uh, uh, I mentioned in the notes that like, there are moments that fish shows that make you keep coming back, like like a good golf shot uh, makes you keep coming back. And it, it was a show like this that did it for me. You know, I'll see I'd seen 20 in between and five or six of them were like really good. Um, but the, the, just the great ones. Oh, I'll, I'll go to 10 shows just hoping to hit one good one. Yeah, this is a great one and one of the great ones. Mm -hmm. I would say arguably the top show of the year, but 98 gives it a lot of run for its money. Uh, but any color you like is kind of the same as us and them. You know, it's faithful. It's fun. There's a little bit of funk jamming, but it's not that different from you enjoy myself in mm -hmm. a positive way. And then brain damage. We're getting at the very end of the album. I thought that the show, the whole show is worth it for the lyric. If the band you're in starts playing different tunes, I'll see yeah. you on the dark side of the moon. It didn't even occur to me until it's about to be saying that this was coming. And it, it, it was weird hearing that because they're not really playing different tunes, but they're like you said in your notes, like you can hear them smiling as they said that. Like it's definitely like a uh, we got to hit these fans good, you know, because they're not they don't want to come to Utah and hear some other songs. And they close it with Eclipse, of course. It's one of the best oh, closing yeah. songs to any album ever. And then they go back to Harpua, which is insane. It feels like they just started Dark Side of the Moon. Yeah, because it's almost like it didn't happen. Short one, but it like that's how it felt that night too. Like, oh, it's over. And that was just like we were gifted something. Truly. Yeah. Truly. I mean, if you went to one show a year, like let's say you lived in in Utah, in Salt Lake mm -hmm. City, and you didn't have access to a car. So with that said, I had a bunch of buddies that went to the show that they were like, I would have rather have seen five more fish songs than watch them play Dark Side of the Moon. And I'm like, you're crazy. Yeah. Like, you have no idea what you were just a part of. 
and they you know they got it and everything but they're like i, I paid to see fish I'm like whatever guys come on that's insane you you just did pay to see fish this is what they do my first note is imagine if twitter were around at the time oh gosh i don't even know i, I noticed or i mentioned earlier in my notes about how social media was just like a mess and it is a mess you know and it does great things like what we're doing right now which is awesome um but if you definitely have somebody just ripping it apart like well that uh they could have fucked up money better da, da, da. i'm like i i just i can only go so far with that because i'm yeah. like none of you guys are up there so even on the worst fish shows i'm like hey i still had a good time it's it's just being there you know it's the moments and the funniest encore I would suggest ever, you know, last time you were on here, you talked about one of the best encores ever, the Harpoon oh, yeah. with the yodelers and all that in Vegas. This time they go in the complete opposite direction with no special guests, nothing choreographed, nothing I would yeah. guess planned out when they play Smells Like Teen Spirit by Nirvana, which I would guess someone brought it up literally as they're walking off stage. They probably hadn't practiced it at all. And let's say, let's just fucking play it. Yeah, I doubt that they had any plans i was thinking like what are they going to encore with like how do you top that and i felt like the tongue-in-cheek uh cover of smells like teen spirit was great i agree that they you know they didn't play it well no i don't think that that's a song that you need to play well like that's the whole point of the song is like i was a big nirvana fan at the time so i was excited but it's all about uh here we are now entertain us you know, and the, the angst of the generation at that time as well. And that, you know, just speaking to the anger, I would suggest of a lot of the fans who were going to find out the next day what they just missed. Yeah, yeah exactly. I definitely. I thought it was like either a gentle dig at those fans or our generation or both. I like to think it's the first. I like to yeah. think that it's, you know, all the people who showed up to Vegas expecting a huge party and were kind of let mm-hmm. down with the more thoughtful and laid back nature of Loaded. Yeah. That didn't feel entertained. Yeah, probably. I could see that. And what was it like walking out of this show? It was one of those shows where I have this frequently where it's been such a good time that you don't want to leave the venue. You just want to hang out there, look around and just soak everything in. Well, Sean Fawcett, the returning champion, to a dead end bias. <laughs> Thank you for coming Thank back you. and making good on our offhand suggestion during our first recording to come back and talk about this show, November 2nd, 1998 at the E Center in Salt Lake City, the infamous Dark Side of the Moon show. You've really covered your bases. Uh, right now you're batting a thousand on shows that you've discussed on oh, this okay. podcast. So we'll have to dig around for another amazing Southwest show for you to come by and talk about being there. I'm going to have to check out my show list right after we're done here. Thanks uh, for having me back. This was great. Attendance bias fact check. The quasi secret show that fish played at the Fillmore in San Francisco before the fall 98 tour was on October 15th, 1998. According to fish.net, the show was never formally announced by fish. San Francisco radio station KFOG leaked word of an upcoming, quote, surprise announcement two weeks before the show, telling Fish fans to tune in that Saturday morning for tickets. The 11 a.m. announcement was that tickets would be sold at noon at the vacant Pier 32, prompting a mad rush of fans to the waterfront. Of the several thousand fans who arrived, roughly 400 lucky people were able to buy vouchers, which entitled each to a pair of tickets. The capacity of the main room is 1,315. The third set of Halloween 1998, with the extended Wolfman's Brother Jam and the abbreviated Ghost, is just 51 minutes and 45 seconds before the band walks off during a feedback loop. The capacity of the E-Center, now called the Maverick Center, is 12,000. It is currently home to the Utah Grizzlies, a minor league hockey team. When talking about the set one closer, Sean says that Sample in a Jar is one of his absolute favorite studio recordings, but he cannot recall on which album it appeared. For the record, Sample in a Jar is on Hoist. When comparing the Las Vegas shows from 1998 and 1996, Sean brings up the capacity for each venue. 
The capacity for the Aladdin Theater in 1996 was 7,000, while the capacity for the Thomas and Mack Center for the 1998 shows is 19,522. In the spirit of this show, Sean and I discussed times when Fish hastily put together bust-outs, and he brought up a time when Fish played Neil Young's Cinnamon Girl at the Shoreline Amphitheater. That was on July 31st, 1997. And that's it for the fact check in today's episode. I'd like to thank Sean Fawcett for joining me today, Fish.net for its help with the fact check, and Fish.in for the recording used in today's episode. If you enjoy Attendance Bias, please support the show by visiting www.buymeacoffee.com slash Attendance Bias and donating anything you can. You can also follow Attendance Bias on social media. Reach out, say hi, and I'll send you a free sticker. Thank you again so much for listening, and I'll see you next week on Attendance Bias.